Okay, let us start our Bible study uh, with a word of prayer. As usual, we will, as is, uh, we will have 30 minutes of presentation and then uh, uh, we will have, we'll keep it open for discussions. Pastor would be taking up from the uh, last week's study itself since uh, uh, some of our members are having questions and it, uh, last week the subject was not closed. So he will be doing from there and we will be, I'm very happy for that. Okay, let us pray and start our Bible study. Let's look unto the Lord in prayer. Father, we are so grateful to you for this time, Lord. Lord, you have uh, brought us through this medium to have fellowship with one another, encourage one another, and especially, Lord, uh, with your scripture, with your word. We learn together about you and about our faith, O oh God. Lord, we pray for your leading and guidance for this hour and uh, help us so that we may not face any technical glitches and uh, we may have a smooth meeting discussion which uh, edify which edifies us and uh, enables us to experience you more intimately lord speak to us through your servant and grant us your spirit illumination and uh, revelation open our hearts also lord so that we may be able to accept your truth and keep keep our minds open to learn more lord through everything we do and we discuss your name be exalted in Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, now, it, it, I may sometimes switch off my video just to stabilize my internet. So, uh, you know, sometimes I may be off, but my audio will still be on. So I'll still be speaking. Okay, let's get back to the question uh, which we raised last time. And uh, I think it has brought out a lot of discussion and of course obviously a lot of questions and I don't think those discussions will ever end because this is a subject that you know does not have a clear-cut finality to it uh, even the scriptures don't give us a definitive answer to all of this and this is one of those things that we have to keep uh, you know looking at it on a point-by-point -point basis I also had a discussion with Mr. Sanjeev Rao, I had a discussion with Sachin and Shanti, uh, you know, uh, and I felt the need for me to just come back to the subject of baptism. There is something called believer's baptism or uh, from a technical perspective, it is all credo baptism. Uh, there is child baptism, which is also called uh, pedo baptism. So these are the two main, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, sticking points uh, for us as we discuss it. Now, let me make one thing clear. And that is, there is no doubts about the fact that baptism is a sign of belief. Okay. Um, everywhere we see, all the scriptures we see, it is very clear that we are uh, asked to believe, we are asked to, you know, uh, exercise that faith uh, in Jesus Christ our Lord. So there is uh, no doubts about the fact that baptism is definitely a sign of belief. But the question I want to pose also is, and I think I spoke to Sachin about this, is it only a sign of belief? Uh, and that is what I want to uh, hopefully uh, go through today. And then we will bring in this whole child baptism. Now, um, to reiterate the point about belief, very clearly, Peter in Acts chapter 2 says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, uh, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. All right. Uh, now, who, who is the audience there? Obviously, adult Jews from all over that particular place. Uh, I remember, it was Pentecost, and lots of people had come in, uh, and they saw... Uh, this miracle taking place of uh, the speaking in tongues and everything. And so here is the Apostle Peter making that appeal to repent and be baptized. Uh, the specific audience is adult Jews. Okay. Every one of you, he says. So it's very specific. So he's, when he's talking to adults, he is obviously asking them for belief. He's obviously asking them for repentance. All right. So there is. Uh, it, that is very clear. The audience demands the fact, the type of audience demands the fact that you ask for that sense of belief. 
and repentance. Okay, what is repentance? I think we discussed that last time. It is basically uh, the change of mind, the acceptance of the new reality that Jesus Christ brought. Uh, now, uh, does repentance stop after being baptized? Obviously not. I think we uh, did go into that a little bit last time. Repentance is a continuous thing. All right. So uh, uh, what I'm trying to say is we have to be careful that we don't take what Peter is saying as one final formula uh, for baptism as a whole. For example, uh, in Mark chapter 16, Jesus says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. Uh, so uh, there are different ways of saying the same thing. All right. Uh, in Matthew 28, we know that he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now he brings in other a vocabulary there, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So you see, there is no one formula. All of these must be put together for a correct picture to be to take place. Now, um, uh, let me see here. Now, we also know that all these things don't fall in exact order as in, in, in any of these scriptures say. For example, do you receive the Holy Spirit only after repentance and baptism and laying on of hands? Uh, do you, you know, do you have that? No. We know in Acts chapter 10, uh, it says, um, while Peter was still speaking, these words, the Holy Spirit came upon all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and then they were asked to be baptized. So once again, there is no order. So there is no one formula. There's no order. But it is very clear when we are speaking to adults, there is a call for belief. There is a call for repentance. There is a call for acceptance of that faith, right? Or the manifestation of that faith. Now I want to ask this question. Is it only a sign of belief? I would like to propose from what I understand, and once again, I'm willing to discuss these things. I believe it's also a sign of inclusion, okay? Uh, it's a sign of uh, inclusion. For example, if we go to Acts chapter 16, the jailer talks about, I mean, you remember the story, I'm not cutting into the, uh, I'm not uh, reiterating the whole story. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul. That was Paul and Silas was in prison. Uh, and as Paul preached to them, verse 31, this is Acts 16, they believed. Uh, they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Notice the inclusive nature of the, uh, of the uh, uh, teaching there. And then what happens? Uh, they all believed. And it says, then immediately he, he and all his household were baptized. So uh, the, uh, this scenario indicates that there is an inclusion. And once again, it talks about household. And we are unable to fully define exactly what that might have meant. Okay. Does it include children? It doesn't say. It could I'm presuming it could because households include children, right? Now, this is again happening in, uh, you know, uh, with, with, with regards to Lydia. There is a, this is not uh, David's Lydia, but the Lydia in the Bible. Uh, this is also Acts 16. Um, verse 14, it says, one of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she and her household were baptized. She invited us to her home. Now, what the point I'm making is, it is also uh, this whole scenario with belief and baptism is also a sign of inclusion, right? So the household is included. Uh, one more thought, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says, 
I, this is Paul talking. I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Uh, beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone. Paul is discussing. You remember, he says he baptized the household of Stephanus. Now, household. The million dollar question, does it include children? Right? It does say the household was baptized. Uh, does it include children? Well, you might say, because of our understanding, that common sense dictates that only those who believe were baptized and maybe the children were left out. You could say that. Because why? We have the previous thought that baptism means you must believe. But here, it doesn't make any of those uh, points. But we, if we use common sense, we can say that only believers were baptized. But I would like to submit to all of you that the Bible can sometimes defy common sense. <laughs> I hope you agree with me. The Bible can many times defy common sense. And so in this respect, uh, uh, it is not probably, uh, you know, categorical that children were not included. All right. So that is one thing. Now. Another point I want to bring out, I, I, I spoke about uh, the inclusion of children there. Children are included in the promise of redemption. Okay. Uh, not only do we see households being included in the whole baptismal scenario, but the children are also included in the promise of redemption. In verse 39, Acts chapter 2, immediately after Peter says, repent and be baptized, what does he say? The promise is for you and your children and for all who are afar off. In other words, inclusive. The children are included in the promise. Uh, of course, there is no mention of baptism or no baptism of the children there, right? It says the promise is for you and your children. So, what we can understand from that is that whenever that faith is expressed, even if it is a child or the children who are included, whenever that faith is expressed, God will honor his promise. We can understand it from that perspective, that God will honor his promise when that child expresses uh, faith. Now, I used one verse last time that may have caused some, uh, uh, probably some confusion. I just want to clarify 1 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, where it says uh, the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean as it is. They are holy. The point I was making there is uh, or rather was the children, the inclusion of the children. Why? Because of believing a believing parent. A believing parent automatically includes the child. Right? Now, let's go one bit further. Notice what it happens with Jesus. The, the very, uh, you know, popular, uh, what do you say, incident that we bring up. You remember? Children were brought to Jesus. I'm reading from Matthew 19. It says in verse 13, one, uh, one day some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could lay his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. But Jesus said, let the children come to me. Don't stop them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like these children. And he placed his hands on their heads and blessed them before he left. So what is the point I'm making? Uh, what the point I'm making is children uh, are sanctified by a believing parent. They are included in the household of faith. Uh, before their profession of faith, please mind that. Children are included in the household of faith before they profess their faith. Okay? So, uh, 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 what we have to understand is if they are baptized it becomes a symbol of Christ's redeeming grace right and the fact that he has included them in the household of faith 
right? So Jesus Christ is saying that, I mean to say, it seems from these scriptures that uh, baptism could also be a symbol of Christ's redeeming grace. The fact that he's sanctifying our lives, it's a continuous process. When does it begin? Well, it could begin from childhood because they're included in the household of faith. From birth onwards, uh, those children who belong to the household of faith, to believing parents, are uh, being worked upon by the Holy Spirit and, the, and Jesus Christ our Lord, sanctifying them and bringing them and, and working with, their, with the redeeming grace. In other words, we also know that all of humanity is included in the baptism of Jesus. Okay. Uh, now, it is very clear from the scriptures, there is no mention whether children should be baptized or not baptized because the audience was always adults. Uh, beginning from Peter, he was always addressing adults, but there is no mention of children being baptized. The address was to the, to the parents or to the adults, okay? Uh, so the Bible is silent there. Uh, I hope we understand that. But now the question is, does the church have the liberty to decide and choose uh, when there is silence in the Bible? When the Bible is not categorical and it is not uh, very clear, does the church have the authority to choose? Uh, as long as it does not contradict any other part of scripture. I was giving an example to one or, one or two of you about modern day worship. Where do we get the practice of modern day worship and with all that we do? It is, it is, it is our liberty to decide and choose in our culture how to perform worship. There is no uh, uh, checklist in the scriptures that give us and tell us that you must worship in this manner or in this format. There is nothing of that nature. So the church has the authority to make certain decisions with regards to our worship life, our church life, when the Bible is silent, okay? So I made a few points. <laughs> Once again, uh, we'll come back and discuss in case you have, should have questions. Let me now just move to another point. I'm just throwing these things at random. I hope I'm not confusing you too much. Am I still being heard? I can see some frozen faces there. Yeah, I'm still being heard. I'm just wondering whether my internet is holding. Okay. Now, when did the practice of child baptism begin? And I think it is, it is worthy to mention here that the uh, practice in, of child baptism began as early as 180 or 280. That is the early church. Now, there is no mention in the scriptures. There's no mention that the apostles baptized any children. But the practice of baptism of children started long, long, I should say, 1,000 years before the Roman Catholic Church. And this is one thing that we need to keep in mind. I was clarifying with some of you. Because we tend to think that child baptism is Roman Catholicism, which is completely wrong. Roman Catholicism came into picture 1000 and is it 58 BC? Uh, sorry, AD. That's when the church split. Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholics as a church didn't exist, as a denomination did not exist until 1000 years after Jesus Christ. That is a very important point for us uh, in, to keep in mind with regards to church history. Right? Now, when was this challenged? The, ch the child baptism in the Reformation with the beginning of Luther reforming, bringing the Reformation. 1500 years after the church started, child baptism was going on. There was no opposition to it. There is no discussion on that. 1500 years after this, you know, uh, controversy began. Interestingly enough, it may be nice to mention also here that. Uh, uh, some adults actually delayed baptism. You know, we are told that adults were or believers should be baptized, right? But some of them actually delayed baptism because uh, 
uh, uh, they felt that when you get baptized, you should not sin. And so I'll delay baptism until I am on my deathbed. Then I'll get baptized. So then I won't sin. I'll be safe. <laughs> so that was also another belief. And I'm, I, I think I, I don't have a confirmation on this. Constantine, the emperor, apparently did that. He didn't, he didn't be baptized, even though he started believing. He was not baptized until much, much later in his life. Okay, so that's another point on history I'd like to mention. Uh, just a few more thoughts and then we'll open up for some discussion. So, child baptism. If you baptize a child, okay, because of all that we said here, uh, is it a heresy? All right, and I think we can be agreed on that fact that when you talk about heresy, now the definition of heresy can be many, quite wide, but what we would accept that, accept is, Heresy means contrary to the core essential beliefs of the church. What are the core essential beliefs of the church? The deity and the humanity of Christ, the triunity of God, the personhood of the Holy Spirit, inspiration of the Bible, salvation is by grace and faith alone. These are the core essentials, right? So, um, uh, would baptism be classified as a core essential? I think we can all agree, no, it, it doesn't. Uh, baptism is one of those non-essentials uh, where we can take the liberty to understand and talk and discuss, you know, uh, in a slightly different way from when we talk about the core essentials of the Bible. Uh, now, let me ask another question. Is it a sin to baptize a child? Well, if you look at what sin is, uh, the first thing we, that comes to our mind is transgression of the law. But I would believe sin is much wider than that. Sin is declaring independence from God, deliberately rejecting him, not wanting to have God, not wanting to have any relationship with God at all. That is basically sin, right? And I don't, I, I could not consider baptizing a child as a sin. So it is neither a heresy nor a sin. Um, okay, so I think I'll come now to the GCI position with how we have understood all of this. The GCI position, once again, let me make it clear. We believe that there is not enough reason or there is not sufficient reason to condemn child baptism. There is not enough reason. Neither is there reason to Include it as one of the, you know, uh, uh, what do you say, practices of the church. But uh, there is nothing wrong in, in including that because we are not necessarily violating any uh, aspect of scripture. But GCI does not insist on child baptism, right? We have no sufficient reason to condemn it but it does not insist on child baptism. We believe that to honor a parent's faith, now we have enough scriptural evidence of parents' faith uh, being a catalyst for inclusion of children into the household of faith. To honor the parent's faith, we may do it because we believe it's a celebration of, of Christ's commitment to all of us. Notice the words I'm using. If a child is baptized, it's a celebration of Christ's commitment to the child. That Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit will minister to the child and bring about the faith. Remember, faith is of Jesus Christ. Ultimately, he is the author of faith. And so we are expecting that the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ will work in the life of the child, bring the child to faith, and then the confirmation takes place, the public expression of faith takes place, and that is necessary, okay? And that is something that we will insist, that on attaining the age, the age of the right age, they have a public affirmation of faith. But we do continue the practice of blessing of children, like we always had, right? We do practice the blessing of children. 
Let me then close with one last uh, quotation. This is from uh, Daniel Migli Migliori. Uh, this is, I found it on our website. It says, while the practice of infant baptism is not absolutely necessary in the life of the church, it may be permissible. And whether it is permissible depends on whether it is being practiced as a routine social rite or as a form of cheap magical grace or instead with a clear understanding that it proclaims the unconditional grace of God. Notice that it proclaims the unconditional grace of God in Jesus Christ and calls for both parents and the community, community of the church to, res <clears throat> to responsibility for the care, nurture and guidance of the baptized child in the life of faith, hope and love. <clears throat> I'm going to stop there. Uh, sorry that I uh, didn't have the time to properly uh, put this all in good order, but let me see what you have to say and then we'll, uh, and I think Praveen also has something else to say. We should have enough time, hopefully. Any thoughts from what I've discussed so far? Hello, can I come in please? Yes, Sheila, go ahead. Uh, when an infant is baptized, uh, does he receive the Holy Spirit? Uh, <laughs> once again, one of those uh, uh, bouncer questions. <laughs> we believe the Holy Spirit works with and in us. All right. The Holy Spirit can work with you even before you're baptized. That is very clearly given in scripture, right? Uh, uh, some of the Gentiles received the Holy Spirit even before they were baptized. Now, does the Holy Spirit work with the child? I, I will definitely say yes. The Holy Spirit works with the child. If Jesus can invite children and say that the kingdom belongs to such of these, I don't see a reason why the Holy Spirit will not invite the children into its ministry, in, in, rather into his ministry, the Holy Spirit's ministry. Uh, but once again, uh, these are what we can infer from, you know, the scriptures. Does that help, Sheila, or uh, do you want more thoughts on that? No, it's okay. I understand now. Okay. Thank Hello, you. Sir. Sikandar, you have a question? Sir. Go ahead. In the New Testament, when Jesus was born, I I don't know the exact reference, but uh, on the eighth day, they took the child, that is Jesus Christ, to the synagogue, uh, yeah. that is church. And uh, uh, that is the basis that they take, some of the denominations take that, that is, that is the base to take to the church. And they have a uh, sprinkling of uh, water which takes place. After that, some years, they will confirm the uh, sprinkling of water uh, into baptism. Right. Uh, is that correct, sir? On the okay. eighth day, okay, they have to... Yeah. I think you know where the practice comes from, right? Uh, the eighth day, uh, you remember children were taken uh, for circumcision. Yes, uh, and circumcision, circumcision was a sign of they being included in the covenant, right? Uh, so, uh, and I think there is a reference by Paul, I think it is in Corinthians, where he talks about circumcision of the heart. So, uh, and he likens that to baptism, right? The circumcision, the baptism is like the circumcision of the heart. And so that practice of eighth day comes from there. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, you know, uh, that covenant theology is something much more, much more larger, which we can see sometime later. Okay. Right. I have... Uh, Sachin, go ahead. Yeah. I, uh, can you uh, share more details on inclusion in the household of faith? Who is included and who is not? Uh, are you saying where you said the uh, 
children are included in the household of faith uh i i'm not sure if i fully understand your question are you saying who is the household of faith or rather who is the household no uh you special uh, this reference to where the parent believing parent come and through them the children are included in the household of faith so i would like to understand more about what is this inclusion in the household of faith they are then also uh, connected that jesus and the holy spirit will work with those children but then i was thinking both of them also work with the entire humanity yes. without anybody of them uh, anybody of that entire race don't know jesus but yet he keeps on that's why they say right we go and we preach the gospel but it is god who decide whom he need to call and when he need to call so i was just saying is there certain people who are straight away uh, guaranteed because of somebody that okay now this is guaranteed that like let's say for example anna god jesus and holy spirit will work with anna because her parents are so i want to know more about that okay um, once again uh, i think we need to do a little bit more study on that but let me just from the top of my head uh, answer your question when we say that uh if we baptize a child we are including them in the household of faith for a special uh what do you say working of the spirit with them you know and and an inclusion of christ you know uh, uh in the church you know and christ working with them the, through the holy spirit you are right by saying that the holy spirit is not limited and can work with all of humanity but i'm presuming that the people who are not part of the household of faith may not be responding in the same way that a child that has been included will respond for example every sunday we have children's church and it's wonderful to see how those children respond to the teachings and to maybe the understandings and for example let's take nathan Nathan our little Nathan uh, the Philips's uh, little one I I would hesitate to say that he doesn't have faith in Jesus Christ even though he is such a small lad he is able to understand or rather to some childish way to understand Jesus and to respond to that and I believe that is a special working of the holy spirit that is as much as i can say sachin but i think what your your question is very deep we need to go a little deeper no but the, it definitely makes sense uh, in in the household uh, how the children behaves here. and these are and nathan is i think the right example and yes when yeah. end of the service when he shares his thoughts and the answers it, it does make sense okay <laughs> but yeah please come back to me in the case uh, you are you you need to think about it deeply and help me there with that okay <laughs> any other thoughts mr sanjiro is ready now to fire <laughs> go ahead mr sanjiro no sir see inclusion of children you are able to hear me yes i can hear you okay see if they are the parents are faithful children also go i mean grow in faithfulness so they are included does it mean that uh, they are baptized it is because actually the baptism uh, is actually uh, it is because of faith we take baptism without faith baptism also of no use i feel isn't it sir okay so even uh, children are included if you say that i accept that up to that children are in, in, included but uh, it doesn't say about the baptism actually even that verses very true it doesn't say hmm. neither does it say baptism neither does it say no baptism okay now we have to keep yeah. that in mind very clearly yeah, okay 
it is now, the faith of children that is necessary that's all i right. think now remember what i said baptism is clearly understood for those who have expressed faith yeah but i am including the, i am rather uh, i am increasing or rather expanding the understanding of baptism baptism is also a sign of inclusion baptism is definitely a sign of faith but baptism can also be a sign of inclusion so the baptism if you give to a child is not like it says by in the quotation form of cheap magical grace but it is only a sign that they have become or rather we acknowledge they are part of the household the household of faith and they are marked for special what do you say favor by jesus christ and the holy spirit to work in their lives and bring them to the faith that jesus wants them to keep thinking we'll we'll come back to more questions uh i think praveen uh, uh you wanted to share something uh, we yeah. got 15 left we'll i think we do that but shanti wants to ask something it seems she raised okay. her hand shant oh okay sure shanti go ahead um praveen why don't you go ahead i can speak after you as well uh, no please shanti you go ahead because i'm going to speak something uh, uh which would be regarding the fundamentals of baptism itself the concept itself uh, okay. so you please go ahead all right okay so um as we uh, i mean uh, it was nice that we could have a, a long chat about the entire question about baptism itself about this and that and all the questions that we to throw at you we did on monday and uh, it was nice to have that chat but um, i uh, this is um, i just wanted to just also point out that um, baptize which is a greek word and baptizare in latin means as a definition immerse okay it, it means to immerse and uh, and maybe this is why i mean i'm not going into the point of yes the kids the children the promise is included and the children are included in the promise um that is all okay and um, we also know what is baptism it's it's a declare public declaration of your faith it's a sign of your faith all that i'm not even going into that now uh, because i've got my question answered all, almost uh, the when we spoke on monday uh, but i also wanted to point out that uh, this this infant baptism or a pedo baptism in some faith traditions this is why it, it was also called as christening okay yeah it was also called as christening so um as you said baptism is is also it can also be an inclusion into a community or into like like even we say even into a church are you baptized a catholic or are you baptized a uh, baptized as a baptist we some people ask like that as well right in verb form so it could also include as like a um, what do you call it as inclusion into a community or a society i that part also i take it but in some faith tradition this is also called christening so i was wondering if baptizen or baptize means to immerse that is why maybe some of the faith traditions so that there will be a difference in this they used to call this as a christening instead of uh, you know be pedo baptism okay all right let, uh, let me just see uh, if i am a question say yeah, that again just talking about terminology okay uh you mentioned baptism being uh, i mean from the greek it is baptismo which means uh, immersion yes now uh, when we say immersion we only think about water right but i think it means much more the immersion is not just water water is once again uh, 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 symbolism it's a symbol but our immersion is in jesus christ in his True. death in his resurrection in his ascension in his humanity the immersion is also jesus christ immersing himself in him humanity and we 
uh, immersing ourselves in Jesus Christ. So the, uh, the immersion is uh, not just water. Water is only a symbol to show that our immersion is actually in Jesus Christ. And to that extent, baptizing a child is like a sign of immersion into Christ and saying, Christ, you know, bring him to faith, work with him, the Holy Spirit, you know, work with him. So I, I just want to offer that. Now you use the word christening. Christening, I think, is the naming ceremony. If I'm, if I'm right, I'm not sure. Christening means the day on which you name the child. Is it? Can someone confirm that? I'm not very sure about that. I, I was doing a bit of research. They were saying that some faith traditions call that infant baptism as a okay. christening. So as right. to not to christen, not to be able to christen. Something. Right. Interesting christen. I don't know if it comes from Christ. <laughs> so once again, <laughs> you know, you have immersion into Christ. But, but I believe... An inference. Say that again, Shanti? Uh, I mean, it's interesting that you, you picked out it, that it has Christ in it, but that's again an inference. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Uh, but I think, it's, I think it's when you name your child. So what people have done is they have added on. Now I'm giving you a purely, you know, theological, biblical perspective, as much as I understand. Uh, but they also add to the fact that they will name the child, and so they have called it christening. But uh, I hope you recognize that the immersion part is, I think, very important. I'm glad you mentioned that, yeah. Yeah, it's important because sometimes you're also immersed in, into, the, into the law, into Jesus himself. So yeah. that part is also important to recognize that verb to be used as such, to immerse, okay. to be immersed in Holy Spirit, or rather to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Sometimes you use that as well, right? Yes, yes. Good, good. I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> Any other thoughts? As uh, we've got, I think, 10 minutes left. Uh, once again, uh, do keep in mind the uh, GCI position, and I hope that should allay any fears that we are becoming a Roman Catholic. <laughs> we are not becoming Roman Catholic. Sachin, go ahead. Yeah, but in today's uh, session, uh, while you were sharing about child baptism and the story, uh, the incident that you gave, you also mentioned the children profession of faith, which means even they fully understood, not understood, but they have shown the willingness to the faith, to the gospel or to, to the Jesus, which also goes back to our discussion saying, at least there is some sort of understanding. We are not going to the level of maturity, but something has been proclaimed to them and they have shown the willingness to accept it. Which and of course there then there is no age of limit of saying when do you understand fully. But right. today you shared and which do make sense that at least they have responded to what has been talked to them. So even right. Paul when he went to the household, they responded to something that was told to them. Right. Yeah, I think uh, an important point you brought up is once again we really don't know. Uh, I mean there is a so-called age of uh, what do you say? Uh, the typical bar mitzvah in Jews. There is a particular age where they say they are now attained where they can reason on their own, right? But I don't think you can limit it to a particular age. I would say, you know, somebody like, uh, uh, well, let's take uh, Hasini, uh, you know, uh, or uh, even slightly younger. Uh, it definitely shows tremendous amount of faith. I mean, in the way they conduct themselves, they're very conscious of that they belong to Jesus. I think, uh, you know, that's a good point that you brought up, that uh, we let just let them decide, you know, when they want to express that sense of faith. David, yeah, you have our, a call? Our mitzvah is uh, at 13 years, just in four. Oh, the bar mitzvah is it you're talking about? Yes, at 13 years, I think. Okay, Th 13, they say that the, that the, uh, the person becomes uh, the age of reason or something like that, right? Yeah, the Jewish, yes. The Jewish, yes. Okay. David, go ahead. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, as I was uh, from a Roman Catholic background, as you were just, just uh, discussing on, uh, 
it's not, I'm sure I might have gone through the infant baptism. <laughs> and uh, also, there's something called a child communion process in Roman Catholicism. Um, I don't know, this two, uh, somehow, uh, uh, um, what is it called, sacraments. Um, well, of course, the con concept and the doctrine in RCM, Roman Catholicism, is not much inclinated towards the scriptures. But uh, uh, there should be uh, an origin of these, right? I mean, I understand that there is no age, as you just said. Uh, is there a historical evidence where it started? Was it from Constantin uh, Constantine or uh, do we have any historical? I'm sure there should be an historical evidence for uh, the infant baptism practice. Or is it just the early church or was it started by a particular congregation or? Uh, I'm just wanting to just get to know on that. Is it an Eastern Orthodox uh, process or, I mean, this is just my uh, <laughs> varied questions. I'm sorry, there's a lot of points in that. I apologize. Okay. Just Keep one thing in mind. Keep one thing in mind. There is no Eastern Orthodox or there is no Roman Catholic until 1050 something AD, 1000 right. years after, right? So keep that in mind. Okay, okay. Before that, it was the church, the early church. Okay. Right? Let's say the Catholic church, which does not mean Roman Catholics. It means the universal the church. church. Yeah. Correct? Right. Now, uh, I don't have specific details exactly when, but I am not sure Praveen might be able to confirm. A fellow uh, called Tertullian, maybe around his time, which was before Constantine, child right. baptism was apparently actually uh, recorded. But... I think for that, uh, it was in the early fourth century. They practiced it very much. Okay. okay, right. But there were some instances of child baptism recorded uh, even before that. I think, but we can come back to you with a proper, uh, you know, research on that. Right. Okay. I appreciate. Thank you. Right. Uh, we have just uh, Salina. Go ahead. Salina, uh, unmute yourself. This is only to parallelize with what you have said, Uncle, uh, because uh, 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 Shandiyaka was asking about baptism immersion. Uh, in Also in 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, there is a word which says where Noah and his ark, only eight people had entered into the boat uh, and uh, the water symbolizes baptisms. So I thought that, I think immersing ourselves into the will of God also is baptism. Okay. Very good. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, you know, Noah's uh, flood uh, was also a point of reference, and also the uh, Israelites passing through the Red passing Sea. Through. Yes. That was also a point of reference, uh, and they're talking about baptism, you know, I mean, uh, comparing the two symbolisms. Right. Yes. Thank you, Serena. <laughs> I think we have uh, robbed all the time from Praveen, but if you. <laughs> Time Praveen wants, but if you are willing to stay back, uh, Praveen, you can decide whether you want to do it now or maybe uh, on if, another occasion. If the, if the group is comfortable to offer me 10 minutes of time, then it's fine. Otherwise, uh, we can think about it. Okay. okay. I think, yeah. So I'm in favor. I'm in favor. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yes, uh, all the time, we, we discussed a lot about baptism and uh, why do we we need to ask a question why do we baptize basically the obvious answer we have discussed previously also is that it is commanded by our lord to baptize right and uh, we need to understand when god says something uh, god tells us to do something there would be a purpose behind it we need to understand the purpose why jesus christ commanded us to be uh, to baptize obviously the first answer is from matthew chapter 28 uh, the last verses, which tells, Go, therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Here, the main verb is not baptizing. The main verb is making disciples. And all the other stuff he said, teaching them, speaking about uh, Jesus and baptizing, all these things, they are to be done in order to make somebody as disciples. Okay? So, Having said that, I would like to uh, bring before you the purpose of baptism. 
every act there is a purpose behind it you know baptism it has started with the with john john started baptizing in the bible do you agree with that yes in the gospels we find john is the one who started baptizing why was he start why was he baptizing because he was commanded by the lord to baptize people what is the purpose of his baptism the purpose of john's baptism are two to prepare people for the kingdom of god and number two to introduce the messiah so he was preparing people and asking them to repent for the kingdom of god is at hand the messiah is coming it is uh, he is creating an anticipation in them and he is saying the time has come now the messiah is going to come and number two thing is he baptized jesus to tell jewish community who is that messiah so he prepared their hearts number two he introduced their heart so the reason i said this because uh, it is written in the scripture as well now uh, especially you will find that was in acts chapter 19 verse 4 where apostle paul says john indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance saying to people that they should believe on him who would come so the purpose of john's baptism is to point them to the somebody who is coming and then what is the purpose of uh, the baptism that jesus commanded that's also we need to understand but this was not understood at one stretch if you read if you, if you get time i would like to encourage you to read book of acts once entire book of acts you will find the evolution of understanding of doctrine so our understanding of baptism the concept we have about baptism was not developed completely from day one when the church was formed we are talking about symbolic we are talking about uh, uh, identifying ourselves in jesus and whatever we are talking about these were not there from the day one from day one the disciples knew only one thing the lord commanded us to baptize and we are baptizing so the lord commanded them to baptize because he wanted to introduce them and he wanted to teach them to somebody who is coming who is the next <laughs> next somebody who have to come that is nothing but the holy spirit okay so uh, that is that is one of the things so john baptized speaking about the someone who is coming that is jesus so that people may accept jesus and people don't know that there is a holy spirit so jesus commanded them again so that they can uh, introduce to holy spirit that's the reason a lot of places we'll find about holy spirit while talking about baptism let us look at few verses number one is acts chapter 1 verse 5 john was baptizing with water uh, and jesus said that i will baptize with the holy spirit but the disciples did not know all that until they experienced that and through their hands whilst they were baptizing the holy spirit coming down number two we'll find in acts chapter 2 verse 38 where peter preaches the main uh, words which we take for baptism repent and be baptized for the so that for the remission of your sins right this words most of the time we take it so seriously and we totally forget the audience peter was preaching these words to jews saying jesus is the messiah he, peter in fact he is reiterating the same message john preached john preached he, he pointed to jesus and said he is the messiah behold the lamb of god who takes away the sin of the world but the jews they did not accept it and they rejected john and his baptism and in one particular place it is written they rejected the will of god when you, because they rejected the message of john okay so they rejected the message to accept that jesus is the coming messiah the same message now peter is preaching jesus is the messiah who was promised and you killed him and he rose again from the dead this is the same so now you repent and accept that jesus is the messiah he did not tell them remember about all your sins what all you have done from childhood so you be confess you confess before god god will forgive you or oh, because jesus died in your place nothing of stuff of such sort which we are talking today peter did not know all these things and he did not understand all these things he understood over a period of time as jesus said the spirit will lead us into the whole truth Spirit led Peter and Paul and others into the whole group, then which we understand uh, through the epistles primarily to speak. So Jesus, Peter was preaching to Jews, telling them, repent, Jesus is the Messiah. And then he was asking them to accept it. 
that is the verse that is how we need to understand that should not be taken as a criteria for every baptism because at the end we find that we come to understand a different understanding for baptism altogether and number two sorry next thing uh, philip preached to the people about the kingdom of god and uh, he baptized them this is especially in uh, we find it in acts chapter 8 verse 12 it is to samaritans samaritans also were they are expecting for the kingdom of god for them also the same message that jesus is the messiah and people have to repent and accept the truth that jesus is the messiah and they were baptized that is the reason in book of acts we will find the st the statement saying like they were baptized in jesus name or baptized in christ name or in some places it is written they were baptized in the name of the lord why were they not baptizing in the name of the father son and of the holy spirit they can do that from the day one because but they did the reason is they did not understand all those they knew only one single message jesus is the messiah and you rejected now you accept that's why they were baptizing in the name of jesus and then Acts chapter 8 verse 26 holy spirit did uh, didn't fell on them so didn't fell on the people they were baptizing sorry uh, so they were baptizing in jesus name only till that we don't find anywhere jesus when while they were baptizing holy spirit coming upon them till then we don't find about the holy spirit at all in baptism in acts chapter 8 onwards we'll find holy spirit was coming upon them then they realized holy spirit is also there jesus spoke about holy spirit and he said about uh, baptizing in the holy spirit he will baptize us in the holy spirit and then since then they started baptizing in the, while they were baptizing they were using the name holy spirit and the god uh, he was revealing through the baptism that there is somebody called holy spirit he was reminding them again and uh, he was teaching them and then uh, that's what acts chapter 8 verse 16 holy spirit will come upon them that's why they preach they, pre they preached jesus as messiah and they preached in jesus name only sorry the baptized in jesus name only acts chapter 9 verse 18 there also we'll find they were preaching in uh, jesus name only they were not preaching in father son and the holy spirit which we are talking today and acts chapter 10 verse 47 where peter went to cornelius house uh, where uh, apostle peter he preached the message that he has he knew only what he knew they you jewish people killed jesus god rose him up, rose him rose him again from the dead and Jew, peter was a very strong person to say that jesus was messiah was sent only for the israel you remember the incident of Canaanite women pleading Jesus to forgive, uh, sorry, to heal her daughter. Jesus says, I came to, uh, I was sent to save Israelites only. You remember that words? And where she was called dog as well. Okay. So Peter was somebody who, who told, uh, uh, who was totally against that. Be, he believed that salvation is only for Jews. And Cornelius' uh, experience is something that opened his mind uh, to accept uh, God accepts all the Gentiles. And he says, now I realize that God accepts Gentiles as well. And that moment, what happens, you know, the, the Holy Spirit comes upon them first. Then uh, Peter says, who can stop now? Uh, that is, uh, who can forbid them from baptizing since Holy Spirit has already come upon them? So they realize that God accepts them. There is a message in this baptism, actually. So Holy Spirit came upon them. So they were baptizing, they, they started baptizing in the Holy Spirit from this point of time before. <coughs> they were not doing that. In what particular place they were telling them, be baptized and you will receive the gift of Holy Spirit. That is Acts chapter 9 where uh, Simon the sorcerer and all come, Peter and Philip, they were John, P Peter, John and Philip were preaching. So they thought baptism is, a, uh, is a, some kind of act we can do so that we can receive the Holy Spirit. That's what they're understanding. They did not have the so-called, we are calling the symbol and these stuff. They don't have that when they, when they while they were practicing. We need to be honest to the scripture as we read that. So uh, we, we find that. And uh, so that they, were, they baptized in Jesus' name, the Cornelius and all, because they did not understand the phenomena yet, because they had to do the, what we'll call debriefing after the incident. Peter had to come back and understand whatever they did. Is, uh, from that point, things change. From that point, baptizing in Holy Spirit and these stuff start. Before that, they were no. Uh, so, we need to come to uh, Acts chapter 
uh, Acts chapter 10 verse 16 the same thing John was John baptized with water but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit that's what Peter said to Cornelius where did Peter know that somebody can be baptized with the Holy Spirit before that why he didn't do that when 3,000 people saved when 5,000 people saved because he himself didn't know at Cornelius house that was a message and the reformation in the life of Peter and uh, then we need to come to Acts chapter 16 verse 16 which we already seen and 1633 and uh, 18 8 where uh, uh, Lydia's household, Roman centurion's household, Crispus, uh, uh, ruler of synagogue's household, uh, they were baptized. So I'm not going to dwell on that because pastor has already uh, spoken about household and there was enough discussion about that. Uh, so, so Acts chapter 19, people didn't hear about Holy Spirit at all. There are people in Ephesus, Apostle Paul, Paul found and uh, they, he asked them, were you baptized? Then he said, yes, we were baptized. Then he asked them, what kind of baptism did you take? said so we took John's baptism. That tells us there were different kinds of baptism. Then Peter, Paul speaks about baptism in the Holy Spirit. This is not baptism in the Holy Spirit should not be misunderstood as some kind of power coming down upon us with so much of fire, these and that. It is the John's baptism was pointing to Jesus that he is coming. He, the baptism of the Holy Spirit here is to somebody who is coming upon them. That is the Holy Spirit and it is a pointer. This is the same thing. Okay, here Peter uh, sorry, Paul preaches to them about baptism in the Holy Spirit and he lays their, his hands upon them and they receive the Holy Spirit. So we need to understand that all these incidents are lessons in the lives of apostles. Later they are recorded so that we could learn. And it does not mean the Holy Spirit was not upon them and all. There are certain signs which God performed in order to teach us, just as he taught Peter in the house of Cornelius and uh, other people uh, he taught in various incidents. So here we, we understand that uh, uh, baptism in, baptizing in the Holy Spirit and all uh, we find. Okay. So but basically when we talk about baptism, there are a few concepts we bring forth. I'm just, I'll just uh, let you know in very short form. That is, uh, when we talk about baptism, we first thing we bring about uh, baptism is about cleansing from sin and the sickness. And then we think, uh, think about incorporation into the community, which household thing that we talk about. When we are baptized, we are coming into community. And then we uh, baptism is uh, sanctifying and uh, illuminative. As I said, it is a teaching experience and learning experience uh, for people. And baptism as dying and raising, which is identifying ourselves in the, uh, in the life of Jesus Christ. And at last, baptism is talking about beginning of a new creation. These are the five concepts we have seen. But in Book of Acts, we find all these five. <coughs> in the beginning, Peter preached uh, that uh, uh, baptized, so repent and be baptized so that you may be, for the remission of your sins, so that you may be cleansed from your sin. And then, uh, incorporation into community. After they started doing that, 3,000 people baptized. They were constantly going there and uh, preaching and come, uh, baptizing them in Jesus' name. And they started becoming like a community, actually. This baptism, baptism is an entrance for people to enter into a community. In fact, when we talk about church baptism, even today, we have concept to somebody when baptized, they will say, welcome into the household of God, into the family of God, into the church, all these things we do. It is Sorry. talking about... Yes, uncle. Sorry. Uh, uh, you're saying so much... And my mind is so small, I am not able to understand what you want to say. Can you explain me, sir, what he wants to say? Definitely, I cannot explain in one minute, uncle. Like for, perhaps I can definitely, I'll uh, take some time to talk to you okay. personally. Personally, okay. I will talk to you on this. Okay. Uncle, personally, I will talk to you. Okay. Uh, I believe somebody is following. Let me tell them later when you have questions. You can. This is the last point I am bringing before. Because it is compilation of everything. Structure I'm showing you. In the beginning, they started about remission of sins, forgiveness of sins. And second point, they, were, they became as a Christian community and they were inviting people through baptism as brothers. And the third thing we find as an illuminative, through baptism, they realize the Holy Spirit is that they, they, got, they got to learn certain things, which we'll find from chapter 10 onwards. First thing we'll find in chapter 2 and 3, Second thing, we'll find uh, chapter uh, 8 and 9 until 10. Uh, from 10, we find about illumination. They, they started 
learning about these things and then la- later we find about uh, identifying ourselves in Jesus Christ this is something apostle paul brings at first romans chapter 6 uh, verse 2 onwards as we speak whoever baptized into christ till now we speak we spoke about baptizing into jesus name or baptizing in water here apostle paul speaks about speaks about baptizing in christ or bab or uh, dead with christ crucified with christ dead with christ buried with christ and rose again from dead with christ which is identifying ourselves in jesus dying and raising again from the dead that is the point apostle paul uh, the, these things apostle paul wrote to roman uh, church uh and then at last thing is baptism is the beginning of new creation which you find in second corinthians chapter 5 where he says if one died for all then all died so when one died for all then all died because of that all everything has become a new creation second corinthians chapter 5 verse 14 and new creation is 5 uh, uh, verse 17 it is uh, talking about those stuff. that uh, let me tell you one thing apostle preach paul, paul preached so many messages Acts chapter 19 is the end of all baptisms. After Acts chapter 19, you don't find anything about baptism, but still Apostle Paul preached so many people were saved, but they did not talk about baptism. At one particular place in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 17, Apostle Paul says, Christ did not send me to baptize. What is happening to Apostle Paul? He was baptizing in the, in the beginning and later chapter 19 onwards, though he got opportunity, he was not doing any of such. Stuff. It is because he, he encountered a greater reality that his entire humanity has been died, buried and rose again from dead with Christ. So entire humanity is a new creation. Now he was excited about sharing this great mystery, which was hidden and he was going and sharing about it. so this is how the understanding of baptism uh, developed so uh, these concepts you'll find at the end of apostle paul's life in the middle of apostle paul's life he says uh, i uh, we are identifying ourselves with jesus but the remaining things has we see in book of acts so we cannot uh, uh, when we come to this to the understanding we need to understand if one man died for all then all died then who is this all does it include children does this all include children all includes children also so it is not about how you are baptizing whether they have faith and all apostle paul realized that all are baptized in jesus christ and one last statement i would like to say and close this is statement by jb torrens one of the great theologians trinitarian theologians he was asked by somebody when we uh, i guess it's thomas tectorian i'm sorry jb torrens when he was asked when were you baptized he says sir i was baptized uh, uh, sorry he speaks about born again and baptism thing he says theologically i was baptized before the foundation of the world historically i was baptized when jesus was baptized experientially i was born again and baptized at a particular point of time whether you realize or not we all are included in jesus included in jesus we all were baptized in jesus christ in into his death burial and resurrection now we need to realize and experience that now baptism is not some kind of ritual to receive the holy spirit it is not some kind of activity we do to receive forgiveness it is not even some kind of activity spiritual activity which makes us spiritually strong or anything it is not some kind of a, a practice we need to do in in order to enter into the church baptism is actually realizing because of the very act of jesus christ entire world is a new creation that's what apostle paul understood and he expressed that's why he doesn't speak about baptism much and he says he was least bothered about it so that's what i would like to say yes so once you realize you need not to take baptism uh, no we have to take uh-huh. it is like we love to take it is uh, god commanded us when we do that we are professing we are learning a lot of stuff we are uh, through a symbolic way we tell we experience being involved into the life of jesus christ so actually what is Now, nothing is happening with we immersing into water everything happened because of the act of jesus no no what is your conclusion actually i i couldn't follow you explained so many things which i read i know mm mm-hmm. what do you want to say actually regarding the baptism uh, this is what i said uncle I, uh, what i am saying is you said now no, for no, as uh, i'll tell you what uh, praveen uh, i think uh, <clears throat> maybe mr rao needs just a little bit slower 
and maybe catch the main points, which I would suggest you do on a personal basis, so that Mr. Rao is able to catch the uh, the big picture that you are bringing out. All right. So let's leave that there. And such a you had a thought? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, uh, Praveen. Uh, so, and as you rightly said, but I think the core of baptism has always been the Messiah. the savior absolutely but what kind of act is he doing to save why we are need to be saved allow me to complete why we need a savior did isaiah knew the entire thing when he told about forecast about john the baptist no but he said did john the baptist himself knew what is the kingdom of god then when repent your sin i don't personally think it is about killing jesus and then hence repent if you know that this savior is coming to save us from what which means if humanity need to be reconciled with god humanity need to get rid of sin which humanity cannot get by itself and hence christ is needed so whether i say repent or you say repent or i say kingdom of god or somebody say believing in jesus has to come with the fact that i cannot myself reconcile with god i need christ and his grace to be reconciled with god yeah. that cannot keep it away so whether we say believe in the name of jesus or believe for the kingdom to become or repent it is still my sinful nature which cannot reconcile with god and i still feel that repentance is when i have a conviction that i need to reconcile with god and i cannot do that i need christ in it it's the outcome that comes i have a sin in me i need him and and as you rightly said and then as you rightly also concluded jesus died for this but then people still need to understand what why did he died got he he came he died he raised up this concept of this thing is why is and that is why probably also the baptism is not i'm not saying the only way but also the way where we still need to emphasize this thing is this the only way i don't think so different when that's why we said if you believe many churches say na if you have accepted lord uh, jesus as your lord and savior you can partake in your communion so we don't say if you are baptized only take but again that core is very much the core of everything so we cannot keep jesus away and put uh, holy spirit baptism everything or 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 a good life or everything and we keep out jesus he has to be a centrality of everything that's what i feel definitely sachin that's what the most uh, advanced and developed understanding of baptism that's why i ended my purpose is not whatever i said through throughout i did not neglect a single point that you have said everybody need to uh, accept uh, realize that situation accept jesus and be baptized uh, so the into the life of jesus Absolutely. christ and uh, my my uh, perspective and my presentation was quite different uh, uh, different in the sense uh, uh, what you said that is advanced thing i was showing what were there in the beginning absolutely absolutely and that's what i was showing how it so, progress yes uh, everything yes. i said from the beginning you cannot take we cannot nobody can take conclusions yeah, yeah, nobody had view of yeah, absolutely yeah how step by step things have been changed the ultimate point is uh, what you have said yeah, yeah absolutely well good i'm i'm glad we could have this discussion maybe we have uh, uh, taken some extra time thank you for staying what we'll do is uh, let's keep the conversation going i mean we are here to learn we are uh, constantly being prompted by the spirit to come to that more advanced knowledge to the full truth the whole truth uh, so we will carry on the conversation feel free to send in your questions and uh, 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 but i think there are some things that we all agree on uh, and let's uh, remain faithful to that that's that's very important okay and as a fellowship we continue to march on as the holy spirit leads us and takes us forward shall i end with a with a word of prayer and then uh, we'll meet be- Uncle Zach, yes, Mr. Shanti here. Go ahead. Just a uh, just a, a small, small suggestion. See, there are. Uh, I mean, some of us are very much used to reading uh, quite a bit of, uh, you know, uh, articles and a lot of uh, research and all of this we do, and so we are very much uh, easy. Uh, we very much talk in these in these 
terms and uh, and, and uh, words which are hard for normal people to understand i mean for for people who are not able who are, who are not into you know uh, deeper into like this so i have a, i wanted to suggest is it possible that i mean whatever we have spoken today was rich and deep and all that but maybe if we could find a way to put it in a normal terms or in a little simpler terms it would make it easier for aunty noa uncle sanjeev rao and you know uh, i mean uh, it it will help i i feel you know just uh, my two cents in this yes uh, yeah you're right uh, shanti i think uh, uh, you know while we try to cl- uh, make it clear but it is also necessary to use some theological terms that will enrich you know our uh, grasp of the deep meaning you know like i use the word credo baptism and the pedo baptism you know that is something that was used by the church but yes um when, what i would suggest is if there is any term you don't understand or any concept you don't understand feel free to you know write them down and then we can uh, discuss them is that okay Okay. Um, I was talking about for everybody, so that you yes. know, not only a few of us. You, you, we use quite a bit of these theological terms, which is good uh, for us, for everybody else also to understand. But it will help on on a larger scale, is what I was saying. Point taken, right? But we are going to lift you up for, from uh, <laughs> level one to level two and level three of theology, right? <laughs> okay. all right let me pray then gracious father what a pleasure it is uh, to uh, deliberate and to discuss and to talk about these deep matters thank you for opening our hearts and our minds to want to understand thank you for giving us the desire to want to learn about you father and so i just ask for your very special illumination to open our hearts and minds to understand and of course ultimately the core is jesus christ our lord as we all recognize and anything and everything we do we bring christ into the very center of uh, it all our lives our discussion uh, because he is the center of the center so continue to challenge us and uh, uh, motivate us to continue to learn i commit all our brethren into your hands for a good night and looking forward to the time when we can meet again in jesus name i pray amen